Distinguished uh, panel member, thank you for agreeing to come to this uh, special event. And all the uh, uh, honored guests and ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure that uh, we are going to have this uh, very special forum this afternoon. Uh, I really appreciate all the panel members that agreed to uh, come for this uh, event. And um, the reason we are uh, organizing such an event is the following. We all know that uh, education is critical to the economic prosperity of nations. Uh, it certainly also serves as the backbone for local communities. Uh, today we are facing all this uh, unprecedented economic, environmental, and social challenges. So education is even more critical today. A technological development and structural shift in the global economy means that majority of available jobs will require some form of college or even more advanced education today. And as our routine work becomes increasingly automated, employees need workers with the skills necessary to handle complex and uh, changing tasks and situations. Uh, however, you know, we have probably recently learned, many people learned that many employers are not impressed with our recent college graduate. And they certainly complain that college graduates are not prepared to succeed in even the entry level position at their company. Uh, as a university educator, we also learned that uh, we've been complaining that the school, the university, probably not do a proper job to prepare our students to meet the challenge. However, on the other hand, uh, we see a increasing number of students not really satisfy the kind of education we provide at the university. Okay. Uh, I became the president of Donghua University last year. For the past year, I saw something, uh, sadly to say that, I, I see more students decide to drop out of school. I don't know why, okay. But this is certainly a responsibility we have to uh, face and uh, uh, to deal with. So uh, we think about you know, how to address all this issue, and this is the reason the real reason we want to organize this, because we'd like to hear from this eminent panel member. And they can tell us their experience and their view and how a successful person can be cultivated. And certainly how one can develop, develop the skill to meet the challenge of the 21st century. Okay, so that's the whole purpose of this uh, whole, uh, event. Okay, we'll start off by Dora. Okay, lady always first, right? Am I on? Can you hear me? Well, um, you have a handout, and I thought I would follow the slides, and uh, I'll ask also for your participation. So what I wanted to point out in the beginning was um, that uh, single subject majors are dated and that to address the problems that we're going to have in the 21st century, we need to really collaborate over a wide range of fields. If we want to talk about security of our data in the cloud and not losing it, climate change, energy, we're going to have to understand to work with and communicate with and create with people in a wide variety of areas. One thing that we want to do, you have this 
circle here. And what this is, is a bunch of different fields of study. And whether you're going between biological and artificial intelligence and materials and devices, or networks, or um, smart energy, these are now, in most universities, separate areas of study. And we have to act like engineers and build bridges between these different areas. And it takes more than just studies to do that. I think culturally, in order to work with people in very different or disparate areas, we have to learn to communicate with them on a variety of levels. So besides learning how to write and present, we also have to socialize and talk with different people. Um, for instance, I work with chemists a lot. My background is physics. And to work with chemists, even though from a distance it seems like a very close science, we still have a very different language. And when we start out, we look like these animals that are butting their heads together. And then after a while, we kind of don't communicate. We stop fighting. But then after a while, if we communicate on different levels, we'll find some area of overlap, whether it's you both like to talk about symmetry groups, or you like a certain kind of music or sport. You find an area of overlap, and from there you can grow your collaboration. I've worked with a biologist in a very different area, and the reason I work so well with her is because we were friends for so many years, and we've had a lot of success in studying together. In the universities, one of the places you build these bridges is just through student life. So um, and that's these pictures here, whether it's a music club, a sports club, an acting club, this becomes very, very important. And I just have some questions for you. How many of you have been involved in sports teams? OK. Not, not that many. In the US, everybody would have raised their hand. <laughs> Even if it's like jacks or something simple. And I list some other things here. So what about marching band, orchestra, choir, theater, debate team? Remember, communication is everything. You won't learn. You can learn from books, but that's already known. If you want to reach out into new and innovative areas and create whole new areas of science and technology and understanding, you're going to have to reach out more than just your book. That's what's um, my statement here. Um, in fact, um, um, people worry that we're communicating less because everybody texts. And my son is a college student, and he's so frustrated by this because you can tell, I think, communication is important. When he went to college, he felt that nobody talked. So he's starting a club, and the club is getting together and just talking. Not just necessarily a book club, but just communicating about life in general. And it's been very successful. So on your, one thing, the, I asked a question here, what do you do on your weekends or breaks? Many students just say, well, they study, they catch up, and they sleep, and then they study. And if they don't get straight A's, they're in trouble. And what I submit to you is the straight A's might be important, but not in every subject. Because when you get straight A's, you're learning what's already been done. What your charge is is to help us out in creating a better world, whether it's through science, psychology, sociology. All that stuff is important. And everything is going so fast and changing so quickly. If all you do is your homework and get straight A's, you will be left behind, and we need you. We need you out there. So you need to broaden your horizons. And this T, this T picture here is not the first time this has been written, 
but it's, it's the way I lead my life in many ways, my philosophy, and that is I try to be one of the best experts in the world, maybe not compared to these guys, but in, in, super, con in super conductivity and how electrons in materials communicate with each other. Communication again. It turns out in the kind of materials that I study, the electrons can be in contact, they were called correlated with each other over long distances in time, very strange. And so that's what I study, and I read papers, and I spend a lot of time alone trying to study that. But I also spend a lot of time doing the horizontal part of the T, okay? And that's just not talking to chemists, but that's talking to people that are engineers and biologists. And going further than that, if we're going to work on our global energy challenge, in some of the centers that I'm working in, we need to understand philosophy and psychology and sociology. So I think to really be innovative and transdisciplinary, creating new disciplines from the old, you need the basis and you need the breath. And as you reach out in the breath and you gather information, you bring it back down again and reprocess it in your language and bring it up and communicate. And I think that is what I've seen, at least in my life, has been the basis for my successes and things that I've discovered. Finally, I have a couple of statements here. This is Albert Einstein laughing about J. Robert Oppenheimer, a famous physicist, because he always made jokes. And Einstein played the violin. And this other guy here is Richard Feynman, another Nobel Prize winner, who played bongos. And so if you're going to be successful in your work, you have to love it. You have to be passionate about it. Um, this last URL here, which I didn't know they were going to hand it out, is um, our physics department got together and did a Gangnam Style video. <laughs> and that helps, right? You hang out with these guys, you dance, you sing, and you get new ideas. And I. And I promise you, new science came out of that Gangnam video. So thank you very much for your time. Today I'd like to talk about um, education, college education in Taiwan a little bit. We have uh, several fundamental problems in Taiwan. Uh, first one, there is a mismatch of expectations. Um, in uh, 1990, about 21, 20 years ago, uh, there were only 600,000 college students at that time. 600,000 young men, women that were college students at that time. Now, they are about 1.3 billion, more than double the number of 20 years ago. 20 years ago, uh, the parents all thought that um, a college education for their children was a permanent meal ticket. Anybody that uh, graduated from college uh, would have a good job and uh, would have a good life. Uh, and therefore, they, they try very hard to send their kids to college. So more people are going to uh, college now. And uh, college uh, education is no longer a, uh, a, uh, a permanent meal ticket. Uh, so that's uh, the first problem. And uh, young people, getting out of college, couldn't get a job, they're getting disillusioned. Uh, the second problem we have is that um, we have a mismatch of skills. Uh, there are many jobs waiting, but uh, uh, there are fewer uh, applicants that uh, really have these skills. So. Uh, in the last 20 years, I think Taiwan has uh, very much neglected uh, uh, trade education, uh, trade training, uh, trade schools. Uh, uh, all right. 
And the, the third problem we have, uh, we really don't have uh, good colleges to develop future leaders. Now, I want to concentrate on, on that point, uh, the point of uh, a good school to uh, develop leaders. I think it's a liberal arts college. I think a good school to develop leaders is a liberal arts college. Now, what does a liberal arts college do? I don't think I can say it better than a report from uh, the dean of Harvard College in 2006, and I will just read it. He said, we recommit ourselves to liberal education. Liberal education presumes a broad education that liberates the individual in several ways by offering opportunities for foundational knowledge, reflection and analysis, artistic creativity, and an appreciation for the precision of scientific concepts and experiments. It resists pressures for early specialization and professionalization. I think that's an important point. A liberal education resists pressure for early specialization and professionalization. Professional education is in the proud tradition of many universities. What you have in Taida is a professional education. It's in the tradition of many universities. And let me just continue on. But it is not the mission of Harvard College. Our students will devote some significant part of their time to special and concentrated thinking or learning. But we aspire above all that they graduate as curious, reflective, and independent thinkers with a commitment to serve the wider world and a lifetime of learning still before them. That is what we mean when we welcome our graduates to the fellowship of educated women and men. I, I really think that's a soaring statement uh, for uh, liberal arts college, liberal education. What in my mind, should a uh, liberal arts college do in developing future leaders? First of all, uh, admission. Uh, here I'm speaking from my personal experience. I had just one year, spent one year uh, at uh, uh, Harvard, undergraduate. And I, I, I have uh, said many times uh, since then that um, that was perhaps the most meaningful year uh, I, I had in all my life, uh, in all my life. And uh, why did I think so? Uh, I learned just as much from fellow students as uh, I did from the classroom. So fellow students are very important, a very important part of the education at the liberal arts college. Therefore, I think the admission standards should not be just academic excellence. Admission standards in fact, should weigh more uh, leadership traits and the kind of characteristics that Professor Green just mentioned, ability to, to communicate with people, with other people, uh, uh, to work with other people, and uh, uh, those things. Uh, 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 
and creativity, entrepreneurship, those characteristics. Now, I, 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 I think that that's a very, it has to be a very difficult uh, job to, to set admission standards across this wide spectrum of uh, uh, requirements. But I think it can be done, uh, you know. I think that colleges like Harvard, Yale, Princeton, they do do it. <laughs> yeah. And now, once you have that kind of mission standards, then the students, when they come in, will find that they will learn more from their student, from their fellow students, than even from the classroom. Now, also, I think that the student body should be diversified. Foreign students, students from from all kinds of families. I think that's very important too. I think that um, naturally, I think the faculty and uh, the school, the college administration, administrators must share the same philosophy that this is a liberal arts college, this is a place where they intend to develop future leaders of society. And uh, now I go on to uh, dormitories. I think it should be a requirement for undergraduates to live in dormitories. Uh, uh, you need to, I think the undergraduates have to spend uh, all the time uh, in school. Uh, now, I think the dormitories should certainly not just be a place to sleep, to sleep in. Dormitories should be a place to live, for the students to live, to study, to socialize, and not just a place to live in. So I think as, as our universities uh, spend uh, what money they get on uh, research equipment and so on, I said, why don't you spend some on improving your dormitories? <laughs> and now, student activities. They should definitely include, besides studying, they should definitely include things like team sports, uh, the art of speaking, uh, debating, uh, uh, and uh, cultural activities as well. Uh, those are, the undergraduate four years are very uh, valuable, golden four years and let's use them to stimulate the students' minds to just as uh, the statement I read uh, says, uh, create educated men and women, uh, uh, create their independent thinking ability, uh, their uh, Lifetime, lifetime uh, learning, lifelong learning uh, habit, uh, uh, curiosity, de develop their cu curiosity, uh, their reflective ability, etc. Thank you. Indeed, this is a very diverse group. When I say it's diverse, because you know this Occupy Wall Street movement. You can classify the society by percentage. So the 5%, 90%, and also the 5%. And I think when I look at the people sitting here, we represent that, at least from my personal subjective point of view. <laughs> like, Professor, uh, like Dr. Chen, I consider that's the top 5%, okay, the background. Even though we have different background, but we do have the sh same common goal that is to try to make good to the, to the society. And then maybe Laura Green and uh, Mac Beasley are the middle class in the United States. And Professor Wu Mao Kun and myself are the 5% at the bottom. When we look at the background, we all came from a small village. He came from the eastern part of Hualien. I came from Taizong, Qinsui. 
So that, what does that tell us? That tells us this world is indeed very vast. It's big enough for everyone. So young people should not be pessimistic. It should be optimistic. There's always a place for us. It's just like what the Chinese said, 天生我才必有用啊. So it doesn't matter. When, when God gave us a gift birth to ourselves, there must be a place for us. Well, then, what is the next thing we should do? We should know, according to Socrates, said you should know yourself. Okay. And that is very important. In fact, that was the beginning and the most important part for educational principle for the West, and then followed by um, uh, Plato and also Aristotle. And actually, in the Chinese, that was about 469 BC, years ago, by uh, Socrates. Then, actually, more than 100 years before that time, was Kong, Kong, uh, Kongzi, Confucius, already talked about some of the sp special things, you know, how to show uh, qi zi ping, okay, ge wu zi zi, zhen xin chen yi, all these things. This start from ourselves. So that is very important. So we have to understand our strength, what, uh, whether we can do it or not. But we should do our best and try our best. And I remember one time, some people said there was a young youngster went up to an actor and asked him, what do you have to do in order to get into the Hall of Fame? Hall of fame? The actor said, you practice, and you practice, you try and try. Okay. Then he went up to ask a politician, what do you have to do in order to get to the, into the White House? He said, you lie, you promise, you promise, and you lie and lie. <laughs> well, when you ask a scientist, what do you have to do in order to, to be able to do something significant? Again, the answer is simple. That is, you work and work, you try and try, but then you have to wait for your luck to fall. Well, let's not talk about investment banker. Okay? That's a little bit more complicated. When we talk about education, I think in Taiwan and many places, particularly in Asia, people are talking about create or educate genius. In my view, I think more important is educate talented people so they can serve the society in a good way. I always feel that genius, you don't have to teach them. They all, they, they will succeed. Because I, f I feel that in Chinese, we always said, 天时地利人和, that means you have to be born at the right time and in the right place and work with the right group of people. That's for ordinary people. You need these conditions to create opportunities for you to succeed. But for genius, they create all these conditions. So we don't have to worry about that. Are we going to educate genius or are we educate talents? I think we should really make it clear. We try to educate talents, genius. We don't have to do that. If we want to, uh, because uh, it's already said in many ways, and I think we, all we need at this moment is we really have to impart because we are talking about this society now is knowledge-based. Knowledge-based means innovation and creativity is the most important things. Because I remember I read uh, the book by, uh, by uh, it's called A Japan That Can Say No, you know. Ishihara and Morita, both of them wrote that. And essentially, I think the West has a tendency saying that innovation has to start off from very basic. It is not true because at that time, I remember the book was written when Sony was riding high because of their Walkman. You know. Therefore, he specifically mentioned even the technology itself, you know, you can reduce the cost of manufacturing. That's kind of innovation. And we should remember. And also, today's discovery will be tomorrow's common sense. You know. So innovation is a continuous process. And university is the source of innovation and creativity, and we should really cherish on that. And I think because time is up, I should stop at this point. Thank you very much. I think that this SHS program is a set of ideas whose time has come. It's not new necessarily, but it's a time in, I mean, 
What I mean by that is learning by doing and uh, transdisciplinary or multidisciplinary uh, thinking and acting uh, have been around a while. And I'll say something about that. But I think the main thing is now they become, as all the folks here have said, I mean, they're critical. And if we, and those of us in the universities don't learn how to do that well, then we are failing society and all the societies will be uh, less rich for that, rich in spiritual and, and, and all kinds of ways. That's, people have often said to me, Mac, where did you get the talent you have, or they perceived I had anyway, to deal with people, to handle stressful situations and to lead teams? I got it playing basketball. Think about it. You have a goal, there's five people, it's a manageable size. Some are really good at what they do, some are less good. Some are dedicated to the goal, some are a little more dedicated to themselves. It's just life, it's the way it is. And for, say, uh, three years in, in high school and four years in college, seven years, I had that experience in a day in and day out basis. And I learned a lot about how to deal with people, how to motivate them, how to understand them, how to deal with the conflicts, all of that. Okay, now I'm not suggesting that you all go out and join a basketball team to achieve that. What I'm saying is there are many ways to achieve that, and if you involve, this is Laura's point, if you involve yourself in activities that have those aspects, and they don't have to be those particular ones, but those that play in our lives, no matter what we do, I don't care where you get it, but go get it. Okay, I don't, I've never heard anybody describe how to lead groups from some theoretical or abstract way that came anything near what I learned through the experience. Some things are simply learned that way. Okay, some things are learned the other way, right? Okay, so, um, so then I went off to college. I went to Cornell University because I was a serious student and I wanted to play basketball. And they say, if you come, you can do both those things. And I was interested in mechanical engineering. And in my freshman year, I discovered, oh, I like mechanical engineering, but I really like physics better. It's not that physics is better in some absolute sense. It was better for me. Okay. And the beauty of uh, Cornell and many American universities is they will let you play around for a while, explore, and give you a chance to find out who you are and what it is you really want to do. Okay, so what kind of uh, uh, courses did I take? Well, I took a lot of physics, clearly. That was in the T model of Laura, the vertical member. Then I went and took a lot of engineering. I took electrical engineering. I took what we now call, would call material science. I took uh, uh, some chemistry, I took an aerodynamics course, and I'll come back to that. But I also took history, philosophy, art history. I loved the art history. Didn't do very well in it, but I loved it. Okay, so what was a B minus? My life didn't change. So, uh, so the point, though, is what did I learn that was a little deeper than a little bit of knowledge in some of these other areas, which is in itself a good thing. But what I learned is, if you go off to some other field, it's really, if you, if you listen carefully, you finally discover that what makes it look so different at the first experience is the words. What do the words mean? Finally, you discover, well, I know what that means. I just use a different word for it or concept or whatever. I mean, you know, uh, I could give you examples, but they're sort of boring and technical. So I got, then, I, then once I got past that, I could, oh, this is what they're talking about. This is the concept. This is the idea. Okay? Gosh, that's sort of interesting. It's not what I want to do, but it is interesting. Okay? And I learned something very deep. First of all, a little bit about how to learn some of these things where you're not going to be an expert. But I also learned that if you probe and get in and understand, you will respect what they do. And therein lies something very important. Just because you want to be a physicist or a writer or an economist, it doesn't mean those fields are the best thing in the world. It means they're the best for you. There are many, many things in the world that are of value 
And you need to learn that. You need to learn that they are of value and respect them for what they bring to the table, particularly as we get into this transdisciplinary kind of thing. Okay, what I talked about was largely coupling, <clears throat> say, physics and engineering. But now it's law, it's history, it's uh, real philosophy and whatever else. So it's, it's a bigger challenge than I had. And that's for you all to, uh, to try to meet. Um, yeah, and I learned something looking back. I don't think I fully understood this at the time, but I certainly do now. And Laura said this too. I am a firm believer in the disciplines. You have to know something well. If you don't know something well, you don't have anything to bring to the table when you get with other people, okay? But you learn something else. You learn what it is to know something well. You have standards. You understand when somebody knows what they're talking about and when they don't, okay? And that is equally important. So in the breadth, okay, it helps to navigate those waters if you have a very good sense of what quality is. And you only get that by knowing something well, doing the work, getting in the studio, uh, your crystal, radio, whatever it is, you'll learn. Now, the last thing I want to comment, again, it's a little bit personal, but that's what I'm doing here. The, the, the title of this uh, little story is A Marriage of Arts and Sciences. Now you might think, I'm gonna tell you something about my experience as the Dean of the Humanities and Sciences, which is Humanities, Sciences, and Social Sciences at, at uh, Stanford. But I'm not gonna do that. That's a wonderful story, but I'm not gonna tell you that. I told you I took an art history course. This is when I was a junior. A year later, I met a lovely lady, intelligent artist, painter, whom I married three months later. We were married 43 years, three children. She died, unfortunately, but it was you know, quite a life. So I led a life as a scientist who was dabbling in engineering, helped form a company, but all the time I had this other side of my life that was constant there on, on a day-to-day -day basis, meeting her friends and whatnot. It was a very, it will continue, I mean, it's a very rich way to lead your life, okay? So open your eyes, try some things, go with the ones you like, marry a person you really like who, who, who can bring things to you of any kind that you don't have, and you'll, you, you will have a good life and you will serve society and uh, I, I wish you well, so go do it. Thank you. We all see this is kind of a, maybe a problem, okay? The, the, our student, after I have a constant contact with them, I think they have this kind of a, a pressure either from peer or from family, okay? Because they were being asking, after they finish or graduate from college, what they're going to do. There's a, a, a lot of pressure to them. And sometimes they don't know how to handle it and they, you know, how to respond to this kind of a, a situation. Do you have any suggestion for this? We probably all have something to say on this. And I've seen students that decide to succumb to the pressure and do what their family or insists on them. And they can be quite happy with it. But I've also seen the student that just really has such a passion for doing something that they just have to do it. And they find the strength to go ahead and go the direction that they feel their life has to go. And um, I was discouraged from going into science by my family and I went into it anyhow. And if I hadn't have at least tried it and even failed, I wouldn't have known. And my family did learn to become supportive, but uh, you don't know what the future brings, and so you have to just try it. Was the question what the student was going to do after he graduated? Yeah, well, yeah because my, a lot of pressure. My advice is simple, find a job. <laughs> <laughs> find the best possible job that you can find. The one, one that you like, one that pays reasonably well. That's what I think. 
he or she should do. Okay. I couldn't agree more. We have, uh, there's a, a wonderful scholar in, uh, was in the United States named Joseph Campbell. He was a, a scholar of myth. You may know of the name anyway. He said, follow your bliss. Do what you want to do. The thing I would add to what Morris has said is don't try to look, is this going to get me over my lifetime to some place I want to go? It's an unanswerable question. If you, I, I think I have some sense of what will happen in five years, but I know I, I have no idea what's going to happen in ten, and imagine in a lifetime. Okay, go a direction you like, that you're comfortable with, see where it takes you, there will be twists and turns, but if you are true to yourself in each of those turns, then you will get somewhere that's good for you. And if it's good for you, it's going to be good for society. Yeah, I think uh, three of them already said it. Basically, follow your passion. And I still remember what Linus Pauling a year before he passed away, when he gave a talk at uh, Houston, he mentioned you do something that you really like but at the same time to do something that will earn you a living. <laughs> but I really believe, and particularly these days, in our lifetime, we'll change our jobs many times, okay? So don't think the first job you get will be the last. With that kind of flexibility in mind, you'll do something really great. Great, okay. Now, we'll open any question. Okay, yeah, Professor Zhou. A few days ago, I was invited to a college to deliver a, a talk, talking about social innovation. And a young lady, the first you know, year in, in college, asked me a question. If time go back to my age as you, which means that if I were at their age, but doesn't, in you know, 30 years ago, in current stage, what am I going to do? Do you know my question? She asked me, you know, if I am, I was, stay at the current time, when I was 20 years old, what am I going to do at this age? Which means that they want me to compare their, you know, stage with my own stage back to my age. So what you would, you know, what, what's your feedback to answer the young mice question? Thank you very much. In, indeed, it's a very hypothetical question. There's no doubt about it. And I did mention that everyone's way can only work out by the person, he or herself. You know, no one can find a way for yourself. I think the basic principle is still there, like what Mac just mentioned. The basic principle, in my view, is to follow your passion. It tells you what you like uh, the, the best and what you can do best, and that's the way to do. You know? And uh, in fact, it's interesting. In 2008, when Bill Gates finished uh, visiting on the Olympic, he came to Hong Kong, so we had a big uh, dialogue at the convention center, more than 2,000 people. And essentially, finally, he said, one of the things that made him so successful is because of the passion. He liked to work on the thing he worked on. And I think the passion business, at least in my view, won't change. And secondly, if you liked what you are doing, you never regret. You, know? you never regret. And I think people ask me, what do you comment on your own job? I feel my job is the best job in my life on earth because I'm doing what I like and still get paid, you know. I want to ask, is any hard time uh, from you when you make some decision, you want to follow your passion and uh, it's, it's a com conflict with, with something real. I want to ask about this kind of experiment. Well, I I'll just go for quickly. When I, um, when I went to college, my family wanted me to be a teacher, uh, an elementary school teacher. And when I told my family I was going to major in physics, they cut off my funding. 
And I was also, they changed their mind. Everything's fine now. But you're going to go, if you're going to be innovative, you're going to make people angry. And you have to learn how to deal with that. And I'd say that the most important thing to me, as at least I'm a minority because I'm a female in physics, the most important thing is you find some network of friends because you'll, you're doing something that's out of the ordinary, different. You're building a bridge. And a lot of people will not be, not, will not respect you for it. They'll try to keep you away. And if you're successful, they may even be meaner to you. So if you have your network of friends that you can go back and talk to or, or whatever, that helps give you the strength and confidence. When you're going around and trying these things, when you're building these bridges, you'll find other people who want to be innovative. And th that becomes your society. Not just the physics department, but a broader society. And it helps you get through. And there will be tough times. And that's why you need that spark of passion to keep you going. Yeah, I think uh, what keeps you going, one is be positive, and the second be optimistic. I remember there was a philosopher from Harvard, men say, you know, he said, this world belongs to the optimist. And the, even when they are wrong, they're still positive. Okay? <laughs> so therefore, that's very, very important. Uh, I think passion is very important. Uh, I, I, well, first, talking about me now, uh, I am beyond the age uh, where most people have retired for a long, long time. So why, I'm st why am I still working uh, full time? Uh, seven days a week, uh, uh, 52 weeks a, a year. Well, it is passion about my company. It's a company that I have built, uh, and uh, I want to continue to uh, scale new heights. Uh, uh, that's why I'm still working. Uh, and I think that's passion. OK, I think time really is fly. We can certainly continue with this conversation. It uh, will be very, very helpful and very fascinating. But we have to stop. Um, and i like all the audience to uh, bring home your, the message that delivered today. It's uh, so, much, so, many, so much insight and very valuable information. Uh, and certainly, you can come back and look at the website. You know, we have everything filmed, and you want to see more. Okay. Well, take this moment. Let's thank the panel member. <laughs> a round of applause. Thank you so much for their work.我觉得每个时代都有它回应这个时代的精神的一个艺术的方式那对我而言这个方式就是一个新媒体透过新媒体的方式我可以用这个时代的媒材去回应这个时代的问题透过新媒体的方式我可以去保留关于这个时代的精
定律保险经纪人感恩社会福利基金会，邀你一起打造属于自己的拼搏世代。所以这个部落呢，在往后的将近二十年，还没有交通。土地都收的收走了，年轻人就是往外工作啊。大家好，我是陈信聪，我是这个《公事有话好说》的苦命的制作人兼主持人。王老师第一次介绍您，麻烦您看着一号机器说声大家好，以后就不用管他们这样。我们这节目主要是在找问题，因为我们发现的或看到的，或是认为可能哪里有问题，我们把问题用一种理性客观的方式呈现出来，其实就很无聊。无聊有无聊的好处是说，你不会把精神放在到底出了什么问题。今晚八点有话好说，深入分析。常常会有来宾问我说，我们有没有脚本？这八年多来，我们没有一个脚本，因为我们不是那一种做球。给官员打的那个节目，所以你一定要有相当的准备，才能够及时的去挑战它，所以那个压力就会很大。做得很累，可是希望可以继续做。不同面向的对话沟通，都是我们很在意的事情。请拨打捐款专线零二二六三三九九二二，感谢您。四年一度众所瞩目的二零一六里约奥运，公示要你看奥运拿大奖。赶快到 Facebook 公式体育粉丝团按赞，并预测中华队将荣获几面奖牌，就能参加二零一六里约奥运看公式有奖征答活动。精美的奖品让您心动不如马上行动，赶快到 Facebook 给公式体育粉丝团按个赞吧。屠兽螺、秧苗的杀手，那个听说一颗螺哈一天呢可以吃七颗秧苗，哎，所以如果说让让它一一直吃的话，你那个田很快就是也会东一块西一块，然后不想吃光那样。所以我们在诶、欸、插秧之前都会都会呃用手工剪螺，就是不想要用药，因为我们是友善的小农。我们书店所装二组其实是一个老的碾米厂，就是都是堆放一些杂物嘛。那去年我们就把它租下来，然后当谷仓。结果今年农地多了，它、啊、那个空间又不够用了，所以一间的话就让我们先把小间书上开起来。对啊，好啊。不然说你前面都已经花了很多力气了。然后那中间那一间的话就是农民的食堂。然后，呃，最旁边那间就是亲子的图书馆，大人嘛就可以，呃，在中间那个聊天，或者是就直接下田这样。的时候，我就觉得，嗯，好像可以夹到一点这种以物易物的想法。毕竟我是在农村开这样子的店，嗯，那我也希望说，你拿你的就是书，那你可以换换我们的菜试试看。如果你觉得不错的话，下次就是来支持我们的店，来支持友善小农。像我们这菜一包就四十四十块，他可能拿着两包，他人就要走了。那我就会有的时候就会再多塞一点菜，他们就是会很不好意思说不要不要不要。这样子其实它彰显出来是人情味，嗯，所以没有办法去衡量它的价值。
。小间这个名字，它就是在日本是引申，就是十六个榻榻米的大小，叫做一小间这样。那我就觉得小小一间，只要一家人有在一起，那。就算是小小的一间，我觉得这样也就 OK。然后我们就把它就把小煎饼弄成是我们的品牌，就是引申为物欲的最小量化，可是是心理的层面，它的空间是最大量化。时的生死对决，物竞天择的攻防战略，公式网络商城，掠食世界 DVD， 捕捉自然环境最真实的动物本能，近距离观看猎人与猎物的精彩决斗，展现食物链中最惨烈的一场生命之战。遇见几年后的自己，你会是怎么样的呢？会是有遗忘的作家吗？还是有目标的舞者呢？或是有教育爱的老师？还是？二零一六青少年行动为电影创作营，邀请十三到十八岁的你，玩影像、秀创意、实现梦想，快来一起加入吧！台北场八月三十一日截止报名，快上公视网站查询。张新贤史上第一个参加奥运的台湾人，他在一九一零年日治时代出生，他的体育生活和国足身份一直紧密相关。高中时，他参加选拔赛获得第一名，但最后获选的却是成绩比他差的日本人。本来比赛就有输赢，但是他觉得他感受到的是一个身为殖民地的台湾人，那获得了一个不公平待遇的的这样的一个歧视。他从此立志要赢过所有日本人，为此他努力进入田径顶尖的日本早稻田大学。他的奋斗不懈，让他成功代表日本队连续参加1932年和1936年的奥运田径赛，成为第一个参加奥运的台湾人。但是在奥运场上，国足身份也带给他许多疑惑。柏林奥运的马拉松的冠军其实是一个韩国人，然后那个韩国人在得在得奖的在颁奖的时候，其实他日本国歌。这个响起的时候，其实他头低了下来，然后用手上那一盆那个货斑的月桂树呢，挡住自己胸前的日本旗啊。韩国在那时候也是日本殖民地。那一届也参加这个比赛的张新贤，他当然也觉得，他当然也清楚觉得哦，他是日本代表队，但是日本代表队下的台湾人跟韩国人。毕竟跟日本还是不一样。一九四五年战后，张新贤在运动场上的身份再度变成中华民国选手。他曾经是一个日本殖民地下台湾的选手，啊，战后又是一个呃中华民国的选手。他们曾经是彼此对抗的国家吧？哦，那当然到了战后之后，他也无可避免的要去承担这些曾经加诸在自己身上的身份。期许自己发挥价值、多位台湾培训选手的张新贤，对台湾田径界贡献良多。但是因为曾经的日本身份，他终究没能如愿成为一九六四年东京奥运的中华代表队教练。体育和政治之间是不是毫无关联？对生长在动荡时代下的张新贤来说，答案恐怕难以填写。每周六晚上六点十五，青春发言人用你的角度看新闻。